we're going to listen to Dr. Stephanie Walker again. She's the uh, extension vegetable specialist from uh, New Mexico State University. Um, she's the direct co-director of the Chile uh, Pe Pepper Institute and the Chile Conference. Um, and she focuses her work on uh, lots of stuff related to uh, vegetables for the New Mexico producers. And then it, she's also involved in chili pepper breeding. Um, and so in this presentation, she's gonna talk us to about some weird and wonderful different vegetables that might be suitable for the farm. Um, we've talked about annual asparagus uh, this morning, which is like weird as well. So weird us out some more there, uh, Stephanie, and I look forward to hearing what you have to say. Okay, thank you. And yes, some of these may be very suitable for farms, others, you know, more as something fun to grow in the backyard. And so, yeah, in addition to chili peppers, like growing unusual vegetables is kind of one of my passions. And I was happy to say that a couple of years back, we did get uh, funding to establish the Jose Fernandez Garden. Uh, this was through an endowed chairship from the Jose Fernandez family uh, that was in support of vegetable production in New Mexico. So our project was to just grow some very unusual selections that people might not be aware of to see how they did. And so we had obviously had mixed success, but uh, if you see that Jose Fernandez the logo, that means it was one of the winners from our garden that uh, participants really particularly loved. Uh, but to start, of course, you know, what makes a vegetable weird and wonderful? There's many definitions. You know, it could just be an unusual color or shape. Uh, oftentimes, these vegetables may be difficult to propagate or germinate seed. Uh, very often, they may be difficult to cultivate, harvest, or process. Uh, in some cases, the vegetable might not ship well or may have such a short post-harvest quality that you really can't uh, use it as a commercial crop for sale. Uh, some of these are rare, although they may be very popular and common in other, in other parts of the world. And of course, in some cases, it may be an acquired taste that you really need to introduce your customers and consumers uh, to. So, so starting with a shape, you know, just as a chili pepper person, uh, one of my favorites, of course, is uh, the Peter pepper. Uh, it's a chili pepper heirloom that was designated the most pornographic pepper by Organic Gardening Magazine. So it's very highly pungent. It grows like other chili peppers, but obviously uh, I'm having to censor this because uh, they do have an unusual shape. <laughs> but getting away from peppers, uh, let's talk about some weird and wonderful cucurbits. Uh, one of the first is the Malabar gourd. Uh, it's also called the seven-year melon, chia coyote, fig leaf gourd. Uh, these are absolutely gorgeous vining plants that you grow for either its seeds, fruits, or greens, all of which is edible. And uh, th these, this type of cucurbit is particularly tolerant to many of the stem diseases and pests that we see in other, uh, other crops. And I have a whole lot of vegetables, so I'm going to only briefly mention these. So, uh, so bear with me here in my half hour. Uh, the mouse melon is becoming more popular. Uh, I am seeing it uh, more frequently sold uh, as seed. It's also called the cucumelon, the Mexican sour cucumber. And these are really gorgeous vining plants. They're kind of like, you know, miniature, miniature uh, melon leaves, basically. Uh, the small cucumber melon flavored fruits are eaten whole. You pick them right off of the vine. And to grow these, uh, the production protocols are very similar to just your standard melon crop. A snake gourd, uh, this is one that I did have fun with. Uh, these are very, very long fruited uh, pl plants. Uh, they develop a twist, like a snake-like shape, and they're very popular in countries like India and Pakistan, where they will actually you know, weight them down to keep those, uh, those fruit growing straight. Uh, you can pickle the young fruit, or you can take the older fruit, peel them, uh, slice and eat like green beans. And if you let those fruit turn uh, fully mature to their bright orange ripe color, you can actually use that pulp in cooking. And that's why it's also sometimes referred to as snake tomato. And here's the, one of the plants I had that did very well. It is tropical, so this is going to do just in the hotter parts of the, the uh, summer. However, they grow very, very fast. Uh, the, the, the vines get very tall. Uh, they grow very rapidly when temperatures warm up a bit, and they grow well in sun or partial shade. And you know, as with many melons, you want to keep those fruit from touching the ground to prevent rot. 
So bitter melon, here's a Jose Fernandez garden winner. <laughs> so, so bitter melon, it's also called bitter gourd. Uh, this is a crop that's native to tropical Asia. It's a very important ingredient in Indian cu cuisine. And I will say that I wasn't that familiar with bitter gourd, but I actually uh, had a trip to Guam, Guam and Micronesia recently. And uh, my colleagues there just said, you've got to bring some bitter melon seed to us. But my clients are, are clamoring for bitter melon. So I said, oh, that's interesting. And boy, I got there with some bitter melon seed and I was so popular. They, they just loved me. <laughs> so, so I started growing bitter melon around New Mexico instead. And uh, it does have a very, you know, it's aptly named, it's bitter. But when we grew bitter melon in our Jose Fernandez garden, it did very well last year. And we had people come to our field demonstration. Uh, those that had my colleagues that were from Asian countries or African countries were so, so excited to have fresh bitter melon. They were just clamoring for this. They were asking permission to go strip the vines. So it was a, it's a crop that really has a niche of you know, people that grew up eating it. So, um, you need to harvest the smaller fruit. Uh, when they get much over six inches, they, they turn really, really bitter. So you wanna get the immature, smaller fruit. Uh, as the fruit ripen, they turn this bright orange and then they'll split open and show these beautiful magenta seeds so that they will disperse. And with bitter melon, you really wanna grow it like, um, like a cucumber. It has similar production protocols as a cucumber. So you will wanna trellis these also and keep the fruit off of the ground. So weird and wonderful legumes. Uh, one of uh, one that's of my favorites is the asparagus pea. That's also called the winged pea. Uh, it's very uh, incorrectly named. Uh, it's not related to asparagus, and it's not a pea. Uh, with this crop, you want to eat the young pods. Uh, as those pods uh, develop, they they grow this develop an internal parchment that kind of a. Uh, uh, makes eating it uh, less pleasurable. So you wanna harvest those very young pods about every one to two days. It does require a bit of a long growing season, but it's a very frost tolerant plant that really doesn't do well in the heat. Uh, it's not widely cultivated just because it's hard to harvest and there's low yields, but the pods are delicious. I really love them just to grow myself. It also makes a really, really beautiful ground cover. And at least in Southern New Mexico, it overwintered very, very easily. The winged bean, also called the four angled bean. Uh, this is a warm season vining plant. Uh, you wanna eat these pods when they're about four to six inches long. The flowers, the, the roots can also be eaten either raw or cooked. And this can be grown as an annual or perennial because typically uh, some of the root tubers that are left in the soil are going to, going to grow uh, the coming season and give you, uh, give you new, new plant growth. The pretzel bean is just fun because of its shape. Uh, this, of course, is that closely related to cow peas. It's going to require similar protocols to plant and grow as peas, English peas. You want to direct seed these about four to six inches apart and harvest when those beans are filled out, but when, of course, they're still immature. So our weird and wonderful solanaceous crops, I already mentioned the Peter Piper pepper, <laughs> Peter pepper, uh, another one that I really like that really doesn't have commercial applications, but me personally, I really love these because they taste so good is the, the lychee tomato. Uh, this plant is also the sticky nightshade or the fire and ice plant. It's actually native to the United States in the southern, uh, southern area of the country. Uh, they're very beautiful plants. They're very binding plants. They're kind of like very spiky, dangerous looking tomato plants. Uh, but it's the succulent sweet fruits that you harvest uh, that have a very unique uh, taste, kind of similar to cherries, similar to tomato. But you will see that the calyx over these fruit is like dangerous. So I always say if we could get a mut mutated plant that doesn't have those spiky uh, calyx surrounding these fruit, uh, but once the fruit is ripe, that calyx will open up so you can just pop those fruit right out. It is a warm season crop. Uh, you wanna plant these after the last frost, a direct seed or transplant, and very similar production protocols as tomatoes, uh, but it is more drought and frost tolerant uh, compared to your typical tomato plant. Of course, they're very, very spiny plants. That there's spines all over the calyx. Everything except for that internal fruit seems to be sharp. So I uh, handle these plants with care.
So how about our weird and wonderful root tuber and swollen stem crops? So one that uh, this is another one. I'm not really sure if it's a unique and uncommon vegetable now because I hear of so many people that grow it, uh, but the Jerusalem artichoke. So the Jerusalem artichoke is great because it can take and thrive in some very rough conditions. So what you basically see is these tall kind of rangy looking sunflowers above ground, uh, but underneath the soil is where you can harvest uh, these wonderful uh, tubers. So um, that's what we call this a root vegetable, even though you have the sunflowers on top. It's very, a very, very persistent perennial though. So one thing I always caution growers who want to start growing Jerusalem artichoke is choose a permanent location because once you have it established, it can be very, very difficult to get rid of because anywhere there's a little tuber piece uh, left underneath the soil, it's going to re-sprout one of these sunflowers. So with Jerusalem artichoke, you plant the seed pieces. Uh, don't allow them to dry before planting. Uh, you can plant them in the fall and then plant to dig up your tubers in August through the late fall. And uh, these, uh, these tubers are very healthful. Uh, they're a great source of inulin. So um, uh, great, to, great to eat. It is a good idea to cook with the peels on and then peel them. Otherwise, it's harder to get that rough peel off of the tubers. So uh, Aka, uh, this is also called New Zealand yam. Uh, it's a very popular crop uh, down in Peru and Bolivia. It's a uh, crop from the Andes. Uh, it has similar flavor and texture as potatoes, but it doesn't have the same pests and disease pressure that can really plague our potato crops here in the United States. Uh, some varieties can be very stringent and you can actually uh, cure these, uh, these oka tubers in the, the sun for a few days to reduce their overall acidity. Uh, production protocols are similar to potatoes. Uh, however, it doesn't need to be healed like potatoes to optimize the tuber formation. Uh, there's a very rapid growth of leaves above ground that really do a great job of uh, outcompeting weeds. And the tubers do form late in the summer very quickly. So many people who grow these think they're not going to get any tubers, but then they form at the last minute. Uh, you want to harvest these when the, the leaves have died back. Another one, al aluco. Uh, this is another a crop that's been grown in Peru for thousands of years, where it's a very, very popular, a staple crop of the communities there in that country. Uh, it has similar production protocols, but it's much hardier than potatoes. And it does come in a variety of beautiful colors, uh, including the speckled type that you can see here in the picture. Uh, with this crop, the tubers are planted. Uh, it's quite hardy down to negative five degrees C. Uh, the tuber formation is day length sensitive. So it requires less than 13 hour daylight. Uh, tubers can be stored for up to a year and you're gonna prepare these like potatoes. Uh, they don't need peeling. Uh, the, the skin is quite uh, palatable and thin and it can become tough if it's overcooked. Uh, something that uh, customers may need to get used to it is it does have a slightly slimy texture when you eat these, uh, this crop. Okay, yacon. Uh, this is another crop that originated in the Andes Mountains. Uh, it's a great source of inulin, uh, just like the Jerusalem artichokes, but yacon is even better. Uh, that's a, in, inulin is a complex sugar that can't be hydrolyzed by humans, so it's great uh, for diabetics. Uh, the tubers can be eaten raw. It has a very pleasant, crunchy taste. It's sweet, uh, kind of similar to watermelon in taste. Uh, texture is more like water chestnuts. Uh, yacons give a very, very high yield. Uh, this crop is not sensitive to day length like the two crops I just mentioned. You propagate this through stem tubers, uh, similar to the way you propagate dahlias if you, if you work with dahlias. The succulent root tubers are eaten and you can plant these outside after the danger of frost. Uh, the plants get quite large. So in some cases you may want to stake just to keep that above ground up part of the plant from falling over. Uh, it's a bit slower growing. So it's a great choice to intercrop, you know, plant your lettuce, spinach, or radishes around your yacon while it's reaching full size. Salsify, uh, this is another one, depending on where you uh, live in the United States, you may be familiar with this or maybe not. Uh, here in New Mexico, uh, clientele are certainly not familiar with this. 
It's also called, called vegetable oyster because many people feel like the flavor is reminiscent of oysters. Uh, it's a root crop, although the stems and young leaves may also be eaten. And this is a very hardy, uh, easy to grow biennial crop. And in Europe, it's a very popular delicacy. And actually this one I picked there, it was a little bit on the small side on the left. I always get over anxious when I take pictures of my harvest. Uh, another one that was a particular winner at the Jose Fernandez Garden is uh, Scorzonera. Uh, Scorzonera is also called black salsify, Spanish salsify, or Schwarzenwurzel. <laughs> Excuse my pronunciation. So this is a perennial root crop that's closely related to and similar to salsify, but it has very hardy, dark roots. Uh, we got great yields off of our Scorzonera. Our biggest, biggest issue really was harvesting it because the, the roots were so well anchored, even our, in our relatively sandy soil, that it was hard to dig out uh, all the yield that we potentially could. Uh, the flavor is reminiscent of coconut and the student helpers, uh, the clientele who helped us with tasting these vegetables really liked the flavor of this one. So sal salsify and scorzonera, they're both cool season biennials. Uh, like as with carrots, if you have heavier rocky soil, it may prevent clean taproot development, but really to plant and to harvest, the, the timing and production protocols are similar to what you use for carrots. So weird and wonderful alliums. I just left one in that I, I really particularly love. And that's uh, the Egyptian walking onion. So uh, this is one, uh, like I said, it's not necessarily gonna be a high yielding allium, uh, it tastes kind of like an onion crop. It's also called the tree onion and top set onion. But what it does is it produces plantlets at the end of its scapes or seed stalks rather than seeds. So as these uh, plants grow, the scapes will arch over, hit the ground, and then the plantlets will root and so if you have these in, in your home garden, uh, what they will do is over a period of seasons, they will slowly walk across your garden. <laughs> so once again, maybe not a good idea for commercial crops, but a lo lot of fun for home use. Uh, the production protocols are gonna be similar to uh, regular bulb onions. How about the taste like spinach category? I figure, you know, with meat, it's always tastes like chicken. Well, with vegetables, these are our taste like spinach. So orich, uh, which is also called mountain spinach. Uh, this is another one that did very well in our Jose Fernandez garden, very popular with our tasters. Uh, this was a real popular crop in humans back in the middle ages up to about the 18th century when it fell out of favor. Uh, this crop does bolt in hot weather or if it's water stressed, but it's very, very easy to grow. Uh, similar requirements as spinach to actually grow this on your farm. And it really comes in a beautiful range of colors. Uh, these are some seedlings of some of the red orange that we had growing in our greenhouse. A red Aztec spinach. Uh, this is one, uh, it's also called huizontle. It's uh, basically a Mexican heirloom crop. It's closely related to quinoa. It has very vigorous growths during the hot summer months. And what you do is you can eat the leaves. You can also eat the seed heads. They kind of resemble elongated broccoli. So that, you know, they're great, uh, great to eat. Uh, you can eat the whole plant basically, even though they look like big tumbleweeds when they're growing. Uh, they're very, very uh, tasty and edible. Uh, the older leaves turn red, which is why it's called red Aztec spinach. Malabar spinach is another one that seems to be becoming more popular. Uh, this is also called creeping spinach, climbing spinach, and Indian spinach. Uh, they're both red and green Malabar spinach varieties to choose from. And these are originally from the tropics. Uh, they're fast growing vines when the conditions are relatively warm. Uh, and the leaves are, are, are slimy once again. So kind of like that same cons consistency if you eat okra. So that's something that may turn some people off until they get used to that, uh, that, that consistency. You can propagate Malabar spinach from seed or cuttings. Uh, these crops do prefer full sun, uh, heat and humidity is better. And we really wanna plant these outside when temperatures have warmed up, but you can start harvesting leaves as soon as those plants uh, start to climb or start to, as soon as the vines start to grow. So how about weird and wonderful brassica crops? Well, uh, 
Another one of my sentimental favorites. Once again, I don't know if this is a great choice for uh, commercial applications, but I sure love this one at home. Uh, the walking stick cabbage is also known as Jersey kale. Uh, this is a, an amazing plant because of its height. And it actually can produce a single stem. Oops, I see a typo there, my apologies, up to six feet tall. So as these plants grow, you harvest the leaves that grow and you can eat them and sell them like kale. Uh, at the end though, once you have these nice straight sticks, you can actually cut that stem, cure it and varnish it and use it like a walking stick or like a big pole. So you use pro planting protocols similar to kale. Uh, they do best in full sun. Uh, you wanna have a pretty good distance between plants, you know, 20 to 36 inches because these plants do grow quite tall and large. And I make sure you plant them very firmly or plant to provide support. Otherwise that nice straight uh, walking stick is gonna be kind of a curved, a curvy stick, which was my big problem in New Mexico. We get very heavy winds in the spring and uh, early summer. And so it just, uh, it was hard to keep these plants from lodging without support. Tatsoi, <clears throat> also known as spinach mustard, spoon mustard, and rosette bok choy. Uh, this is a great crop that uh, it's a leafy green that withstands very, very cold temperatures. So it uh, will go you know, well into the fall into very cold temperatures down to 15 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, it can overwinter in very cold areas with a row cover or some minimal temperature protection. And of course you can harvest these in about uh, 45 to 50 days. So fairly rapid turnover where you can get a crop after planting. So how about a weird and wonderful leafy greens and other colors too? So Clotonia, also known as miner's lettuce, a winter purslane and Indian lettuce. Uh, this is another very, very cold tolerant leafy green that's actually native to North America. And the name miner's lettuce actually comes because this was a, used as a, a food source by miners during the California gold rush. And certainly, uh, you know, it's very cold out. Having a nice leafy green to be able to harvest and eat is a, a good way to contribute to a, a very important healthful diet. Uh, once again, fairly rapid turnover this crop, about 40 days to harvest, and you can make multiple cuts and the plants will regenerate. Celtus. So this was another surprising find and a big hit at our Jose Fernandez garden. Uh, Celtus is also called asparagus lettuce or stem lettuce. So it might not really be a leafy green per se, but it is closely related to lettuce. Uh, the plants look like a cross between celery and lettuce. And what you're actually doing is growing these for the soft uh, green internal part of that stem that you can slice and dice for salads. And we found people really love the flavor of this. The, the students just uh, really enjoyed the celtus uh, that we harvested. A uh, cooked celtus tastes like a cross between summer squash and artichokes. So it has a very unique flavor profile. So it is a cool season crop. Uh, the planting protocols and production are similar to lettuce. You want to harvest these when the stem is about 12 to 18 inches long. And the biggest problem with this as a crop is that uh, the outer um, Outer edges of these plants contain a bitter milky sap, so you need to peel them to get the internal part of that stem uh, that's actually where the good eating part is. So that might be, a, you know, it's not like just picking up a carrot and eating it. Some preparation is involved to actually enjoy this. But like I said, it was a unique and thoroughly enjoyed crop by, by participants in our Jose Fernandez garden. Cardoon. Okay, this was another one that uh, we actually never got around just because of uh, lack of help and time and the pandemic. We didn't get around to actually harvesting this one, but boy, was it productive. Uh, so Cardoon is closely related to artichoke. It has a similar production protocols to artichoke, but it's a tougher plant and easier to grow. It grew extremely fast for us. And uh, essentially it looks like a big artichoke plant, except that the buds, there's a lot more of the purple flowers on it and they're much smaller. So if you don't grow this to actually eat it, it makes a very attractive back border plant. And uh, the part of cardoon you actually wanna eat is the blanched leaf stalks and the inner midribs that you eat as a steamed vegetable. 
And so uh, here's a picture from our Jose Fernandez garden there where you can see all the buds. They haven't quite popped into those beautiful purple flowers, but they're close. Uh, you can start these from seed or transplants. You want to establish these when all danger of frost is passed. Uh, they do best in full sun. Uh, they get very, very large. So we planned, you know, for a lot of space between these plants, but we still, they were just overcrowded, uh, way too much in our Jose Fernandez garden. So plan to give them a lot of space to spread because they'll grow quite rapidly during the warm months. And in order to actually harvest these as a vegetable, you want to uh, blanch those inner midribs. So tie the leaves together when they've reached a decent size or you know, block the sun with newspaper, cardboard, or another appropriate material or berry to blanch that inner part of the plants. Uh, blanch for about two to three weeks before you harvest and then, uh, then consume those inner midribs as a steamed vegetable. Like I said, we didn't get a chance to taste these, unfortunately. We really enjoyed them for their beauty though. So uh, why are unusual vegetables important? Uh, you know, today's unusual vegetables may be tomorrow's commercial crops. I was uh, looking through an old reference book I have on unusual vegetables and some of them listed like sweet potato. You know, sweet potato is not unusual anymore. It's, it's grown a lot, it's consumed uh, widely, uh, but there was a time when it was a novelty. Uh, growing and eating unique vegetables is a, is a fun and enjoyable experience. I guess it's kind of become a hobby of mine. <clears throat> After I was first asked to give a talk about unusual vegetable selections many years ago. So now I, I regularly try to plant one or two new things in my home garden and uh, having the Jose Fernandez uh, field to really uh, actually put in replicated trials of some of this stuff has been a, a wonderful experience for us. And I will always remember the quote from Thomas Jefferson, the greatest service which can be rendered to any country is to add a useful plant to its culture. So with that, I have a few minutes for questions. Uh, and they went through those pretty quick and I took a lot, of, uh, lot out of this presentation just to make sure I had enough time to cover these that were some of my favorites. Okay, well, thank you, Stephanie. Um, make sure that you fill out the evaluation. And there are a few questions that came through the Q&A session. Uh, one of the questions was about the seven-year melon. Um, could you tell us a little bit about roughly the length of time that it takes? Because they were saying, could we try and grow it here? Do we have, a, you know, does it take 100 days, 200 days? You know, do you have an idea? Yeah, no, it, it's going to be uh, you know, about the same as for uh, a muskmelon or cantaloupe. Oh. You know, you probably want to, uh, you know, have, I presume you put your melons with plastic mulch or mulch there. Is that correct? Yep. Yeah. <clears throat> so I would use uh, similar protocols to what you're currently doing with your melon crop. So it is going to do better uh, with warmer conditions or anything you can do to, to enhance, uh, you know, enhance the growing conditions as you would for melons. Okay, well, that's great. That, that you know, I, that's what I would have answered, but I wanted you to, to expound on that. So someone asked also about some of the, the root crops, and they said, can you propagate them like sweet potato from, um, you know, doing cuttings or something like that, or you just have to get root pieces or so to, to grow them? How do, you, how do you do that, and what do you know about yeah, I haven't tried to propagate very many of them myself, but I would think that you can, yes. Um, like I said, I haven't tried it myself, so I can't guarantee it, but, but my understanding of the crop, you should be able to propagate them from root pieces. Okay, that, that's also what I would think. So a couple vegetable specialist minds think alike, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> High five. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, asparagus pea uh, doesn't like the heat. Can it take the shade though? And uh, par yes, partial shade. Okay, part, yes. And so yeah, so be careful with when you say shade, people sometimes stick them in the dark and that doesn't work, so. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Their idea of shade is not what my idea of shade is, so. Um, and then uh, um, also, um, uh, let's uh, ask the last one about some of the spinach-like greens, um, nutritional issues. Do they have oxalates and some of those kinds of problems just like the spinach does, or is that why they're kind of interesting in that they don't have those? Yeah, I, you know, I, 
I don't know for a fact that 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 they all don't have them. I'm quite certain that they all have uh, less concern with that compared to spinach. I mean, these are for the most part they're distantly related or not related at all to spinach. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. I, I think I remember something in past history that because they're not in that same um, family of plants, there therefore many of these don't have that kind of issue. So certainly they might be one if you have some concerns about oxalates in your diets and want to get away from spinach, try these. And, and certainly the ones that are, um, uh, you know, kind of uh, certainly more heat tolerant, you know, that's one of the problems with, we, with spinach is that it just doesn't like the heat and it bolts away really quick for us. And, and so, Absolutely. yeah. So that good, good questions, people. Thanks for, well, let's see if you have one more here because we got about one more minute. Oh yeah, there's a couple more. We were given a 900 year old corn cob that had seeds and, and uh, someone says, and I'm, uh, you know, I'm not sure that we probably have a 900 year old corn cob, but you know, if you were to propagate some of that old seed, how would you get it to, to, to grow <laughs> given that, given your last <laughs> oh. picture? <laughs> Wow, oh, <laughs> my last fish. Yeah, that was one of, yeah, I was really proud of that, uh, <laughs> that corn. I was, actually, I was kind of dabbling in a breeding of corn and kind of uh, realized it took too much space for what, for my needs. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, there's definitely a lot, you know, if, I presume you've already tried to see if the seed was viable now, and probably 900 years is a pretty long time unless it's been in very, uh, very special storage conditions. Uh, there are laboratory techniques that can be used that may help to uh, rescue seed that is otherwise otherwise appears dead, but I, it's not really my area of expertise. So you know, Dan could certainly put you in touch well, with some of the labs that may yeah, rescue. Yeah, we, we can we can talk about it. You know, one wonders whether it's 900 years old. I know how things get passed down through families, and they maybe maybe 100 years I would believe, but not 900. So it's old <laughs> seeds. <laughs> So, so yeah. certainly old seed is, is something that, uh, you know, is a little bit challenging because uh, it, unlike weed seeds and some of those other things, um, they don't really function very well. So, 